at this. I come up here to fly this morning. I race my rear end up here. Now look who's on my circle. Rudolph. Bambi. Get off my circle. Look at this. Tune pipe deer. Get off my circle. Where's the other one? Unbelievable. Boy, if it isn't the geese, it's always something. Argosky, you'll never learn how to fly as long as we're here. We're going to judge every flight. Oh my god. Unbelievable. There was a snapping turtle here one day. Look at this. I got to deal with robin red breasts. You're getting even with me for not filling the bird feeder this morning. Yeah, I'm going to take all the worms out of the field too. Alright, let's get going here. Should be a good day. Now today what I did, I brought out a bunch of the old two blade props. I had a three or four that were made for Tsunami. Obviously Tsunami is no longer. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to try them one by one on the sea flyer. See which ones kind of worked well. Now this is one that I had cut down to 11 7 8 and it had a complete under camber back end. I took a flight. This is, this is the way things have been working. I took a flight on a brand new gallon of fuel and I didn't, you know, never, never checked it. I was in a rush to load the van and here's what happened. And this can happen to you too. I have the fuel. See all the foam and fuzz in there? Well, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to put the armor all in the fuel. Now, if you wind up that you don't put the armor all in the fuel, what happens is, and you can, I just, I've shown this before, and I think Art Adamison is the one who gets the credit for this. Good old, ordinary armor all. If you've never seen this before, you'll be amazed. You put two squirts of armor all in the fuel. If you forget to do it like I did, believe me, the motor run will tell you. Nothing. Almost no bubbles at all. No foam. Now what the indicator is, is when you're running a small diameter prop, where the engine is really cooking at the end of the flight and it's running hot, and you don't have the armor on the fuel, you get that where from the last maneuver on, or maybe even from some of the maneuvers on, it just goes leaner and leaner and leaner to the point of being ridiculous. So that's a good trick. That's one you don't want to leave out. Well, don't be like that. Old fashioned armor roll. One can will last you for a lifetime. Anyway, what's happening in the middle of this test program here is we are rapidly losing the air. It's starting to go bye bye, so I don't know how much longer we're going to get. But I would like to get each one of the props on. I'm kind of kind of settled in on the idea this plane is going to need about a 12 or a 12 and a quarter. And I have two or three more wood props I can paint up, but I really want to settle on the diameter and if I want them de-pitched or pitched. Well, I hope by the end of the day I have that information and I can go home and paint some props. Now this test session taught me something important too about this particular plane. When you get in this, this prop's 11 and 7 eighths. When you get down anywhere below 12 inches, it really starts to get weak. Overhead 8, top of the hourglass gets very wimpy. When you get much above 12 and a half, it starts to have that feeling like there's a rock in the nose. And it starts the GP and need the rudder adjusted. So the conclusion I've come to, and I hope it's a valid one, is I'm going to try to get three or four props made up between maybe 12 and 12 and 3 eighths. And that should give me a good selection to start final tuning and narrowing this setup down before I go back to the double star. And that'll require a whole the, the whole test to be done over again. Dear, just in time to see the air go bye bye. Look at this. How you doing, Og? How's your knees doing? How's the knees doing? Forget it. Well, we got we have lost. The air is the winner today. We're gonna go home now. We got some good ideas where we want to be with the prop on this. And of course the next thing is find some props, strip them down, sand them, and get them painted to match the plane. Not a bad test day. Now we're about at the end of the time that we've allocated to test two blade props. Again, the conclusions that we came to, our first choice is going to be a 14.5 rev up. 
Now, the only problem with the obviously impossible to get, hard to get, Tom Richards has said he can find some for us. If I do, I'll be sure to pass them along. I did manage through all the inventory that I've had. I've got four, one, two, three, four left, and I'm going to repaint a few. But what I did wind up today is, and what I'll call this, this would be the envelope. In today's test, when I got much below 12 inches, right around 12 inches of diameter, things got real wimpy. Overhead eight got wimpy. Everything kind of got soft. And above 12 and a half inches, plane started to feel nose heavy. Now what happens is, inside of this, every plane is a little different. You have a range. In our case, we have a pretty wide range of what we, let me go get the phone. Now again, within that range, what I'd like to wind up with is a 12 inch, 12 and an eighth, 12 and a quarter, 12 and three eighths, and a 12 and a half. This will be as far as far as I could tell, this would give me in probably one spare. In fact, the spare is going to be an 11 and 7 eighths because we don't have any more. But that would give me a total of six props. Look at this phone ringing today. Believe it. And what I usually have to do is make an interpolation. And, and this, this I do, kind of a seat of the pants thing. But when I'm developing a prop, runway air and circle burners, what I need to have is something that's strong, to fly at the circle burners, so I need more pitch. When I'm out on runway air, I need something that's a little weak, less pitch. Now see, this is where a day like today came in real handy, is I can take from my supply of props, and I just happen to hit the one with the little red tips that were painted, was somewhere around 12 and a half inches, Okay, and it had some pitch carved out of it, so it was kind of wimpy. So what I'll do is I'll relegate this prop rather than trying to recarve it. This will be a runway only prop. Now, if you're making a prop, before you even go to the nets, if you get something that you're happy with, say it in confined air, this is the direction you're going to need to go in. You're going to want a little less pitch, a little bit weaker of a prop, and if you, on the other hand, if you if you're coming from say Massachusetts down to here. Well, you know the prop that worked in Massachusetts, when you come to the circle burners, you're going to need a little more prop, maybe a little more diameter, a little more pitch, more drive. In confined air, you always need drive, and you have no concern with whip up. There's no whip up at the circle burner field. There's no whip up anywhere that the air is confined or there's trees all around. In open air, you concern yourself with the fact you don't want to overpower the plane, you're concerned with whip up. So these are the two factors. And if you know, for instance, when we're developing a prop at the circle burner field, we want one that's going to feel wimpy at the field, it'll feel just right here. If we're developing one out on a runway in Massachusetts and then we're going to come to the circle burner field, it better be super strong and overpowering the plane there, or when you get here, you're going to die. And we had a good example of that last year when Mike Rogers came to the field and couldn't understand why the prop that worked at flushing wouldn't work at all. And he just happened, we just happened to have a spare 13.6 rev up that I had put a lot of extra pitch in on a hot day. Bingo! And he was very competitive. A couple things other than that to concern yourself with is heat. When you usually get to the Nats, it's June, July, August. It's hot. The three H's, hot, high, Muncie isn't high, so it's not a problem. This you don't even care about. And humid. Now, anybody that's gone out flying on a day when it's really humid and you can, like in Lake Charles, and it's real humidity and it's looking like, oh my God, it's getting rid The three H's, each one of them deteriorates performance. So you'd always like to, in addition to having the props that you normally run or that you're happy with, you like to have at, we at least one prop that has a little bit of extra pitch. So if the three H's happen to come into play, hot, high, or humid, you don't want to have a radical change. See, this is what people don't understand. Here's, here's what I would like to have happen, is I would like to select, and maybe I'll take the 12 and a quarter inch one, and I'll put some extra pitch. I'll mark each one. Now, the plane basically won't change trim radically with this selection of props. But what will happen, if I see it's going to rain, it's really getting hot out, it's in the 90s, I want to have that prop with a little bit of extra pitch. 
If you come out in the morning, and this happens all the time, and all of a sudden you're in a jacket, well, I want one of the props, and the diameter is really not super critical, I want one with less pitch. In this case, the one with extra pitch will have a little Phillips entry. This one will have a little bit of pitch taken out of the trailing edge. Slight variations. You don't think these variations matter, but believe me, when you get to the, the Nats, you look back and say, oh man, why didn't I do that at the shop? And there you are in a motel room carving and cutting and sanding and chopping. You can't get a test flight. There's 40 guys on each circle and everybody's breathing down your neck. And you have planes to fix and the Dairy Queen closes early and everything. So my, my thought is today is a, a ride off flying day. I'm going to spend the better part of the day getting this part of my prop program in order. And I like to do this ahead of time. It's, very, it's the most significant thing. And this is something I'm a. It, it may think you may think that I spend an awful lot of time testing props and fooling with props and, and yeah. Well, you know, I just go put a 13.6 on a plane and go fly it. Well, I guess if you have more flying talent, you can do that. But I don't have that much flying talent. I always like to make the plane do as much of the flying as possible. The props are the most significant trim part of my setup, including the motor the muffler, or if in the case you're using a pipe. If I had the choice of being at the Nats and at the last minute I had to switch motors, switch mufflers or switch to some other exhaust, I would want to keep the prop. The prop is what's going to do the work. The prop does more in my estimation than all of these combined. If you get the right prop, such a big trim advantage, and if you have the wrong one, you could just die when you get there. Okay, having said that, let's go cut some props. painted enough props on tape. I'm not going to bother showing this again, but just a real quick thing. Some of these are used props, some are new. First thing I want to do is strip off all the old finish, whether it's varnish or paint. A little tub of acetone, I'll just wipe it with paper towels. I'm going to use my little gauge to get all the diameters trimmed, and then take the ones I want a Phillips entry, put the Phillips entry. This is all covered on the props tape, so I don't want to just make this redundant over and over stuff. But we will try to get, in fact I got four new ones, I thought I only had three. So I will wind up at the end of this day with six new props to put into the inventory. Now the reality is, <laughs> probably by the time we get to Nats 5 of these are going to wind up on somebody else's plane. But if I get one prop that really flies the plane rock solid, gives it its best possible corner, and handles the humidity and temperature, I will have succeeded because I want the plane to do as much of the flying as possible. I don't want to be sitting there making endless corrections because I have the wrong prop on a plane. Believe me, this is time well spent. Usually the acetone will take the finish right off. I've never seen one of these gauges. All it is is a pin. Insert in, and then I can trim the blades. I do it on a grindstone, sanding belt, whatever. And I have one of every size now. So when I put them all together, and they're all sanded down, I don't have them in order here yet. But I let each one is just a little bit length, a little bit different in length. And I'm from 12. I had to put them in order. See if I was cool, I'd have them all in order. And of course I'll mark them which is which. Now I want to make one of them with a Phillips entry, and I want to make one with a little bit less pitch. So I'll have the whole set complete. Now you also another thing is you never want to have a razor point on the corners. You want to get each corner beveled just a little bit, maybe about sixteenth of an inch radius. Otherwise the paint starts to peel right at the corner, and then you're in trouble. And a little bit of a radius here, not a lot. You can see these are the two props that I had that were previously painted. You see the under camber that's in there? These were both under cambered, so I want to keep these. I don't, I don't really see any big significant advantage in under camber, other than to make them a little bit lighter. They don't seem to run a whole lot different. 
expect, if anything, they get a little wimpier, so it may work out that they'll be good runway props. Just having that little under camera. Now, don't, if you're going to under camera, don't make these things paper thin at the tips or they'll snap. Just, I'd say, just the slightest little bit, a 64th of an inch is plenty. Now, let's see if you can, just to get an idea, a stock one and an under camber one. You see the extra curve in there? Again, this just shows I use props over and over and over again. Once you have a good prop, no two wood props are ever exactly the same. The grain is a little different. But but this one that I marked, and where the hell did I mark it? Oh, I, I marked medium on it. It was a medium speed prop. This this really was a nice prop for the circle burner field today. So this is one that I'll want to save out of all the, uh, the koi varieties I have here. What I always try to do is get a radius on the edge. No real razor blades, otherwise the paint it's so thin at the tip it'll start to fill up and shift and if you're going to paint them. Or obviously you could just leave the props one coat of clear and that wouldn't be a significant thing if you're not doing a semi-scale plane. Keeping that as part of the illusion is not really important. But a nice radius and then of course each one balanced. Now this is what I love. Some of these props are really terrible. This one is really bad. Now, if you were to put this right on an engine, you'd be having some stress cracks in the paint. In the case where I'm not trying to change the pitch, I try to take all the material, at least on these, on the wide blades, out at the tip. The closer to the tip, of course, the less you have to move and take off. But it's okay if you really have one out of balance. Just try to remove it equally off the whole blade. This one was really bad. Now, see, this is what I'm talking about, about wood wraps. If you only have one or two, if this was the only 14.5 you had ever tried, you probably wouldn't be happy. It's still out of balance. This is this is one that's going to need a lot of material. You can even feel it. But that's the way. Each, wood props are alive. Each one is just a little bit different. Okay, these are ready to paint the little yellow tips. I guess, <laughs> I guess this ends our prop working session for the day. This has to dry overnight anyway. Karen just called and told me they have Redwood mulch on sale at Home Depot. Get my ass down there and buy 20 bags. So My wife always has the last laugh. Believe me. Anyway, you really can't do much more than getting the prop tips. This has to dry overnight. So we'll start working on it. Actually, it's this is really all I could do even if it wasn't on sale. And always, always with props. Get the paint on plenty wet so you get a good bind. Well, I'm just going to let these dry overnight. See you tomorrow. It's been a good day. As we always do in the evening, we feed the fish and all this white pollen that's coming into the pond. God, what a minute. Look at all the junk on the top of this pond. A mess. Now we came up to the club field here with Kenny. We're going to try to set up to do some uh, <coughs> professional, I <coughs> use that word discriminately, some professional shots for the magazine, what we hope will be a, a future construction article. Again, I'm looking around. We didn't miss a day of flying here, that's for sure. The wind has been puffy and forget about it. Anyway, we'll try to get some nice pictures taken today. Yeah, here comes the wind again. The wind is just on again off again. You just, just can't believe how bad the weather's been this year. Try to capture the fact that we know what we're doing here. <laughs> totally professional in every way. Oh boy, if only that were true. If only that were true. I didn't even think of it. I should have put the four-bladed prop on before. Ah, that was good. We'll get other pictures.
You want to take some down by the house? Take half here and half by the house? Need a wipe off. Get better with the cannons on. I'm sure somebody's going to break those cannons at the Nats, though, that's for sure. Yeah. I better make about six extra Probably sets. Stop there and we'll <laughs> make them out of sausages or something. Yeah, they're vulnerable. That's really a vulnerable part of the plane. I want your cannons on. Really. You'll be my cannon maintenance man, huh? No, I don't think so. Nah, there's nothing like dealing with professionals in this hobby. And I can't wait to do that <laughs> at some point in time. I can't wait to get paid. <laughs> okay, we got a little bit of time left here today. We did a nice photo shoot anyway. I want to get these back masked so that the yellow is back masked and then paint the black the next step. Now one of the things, whenever you back mask or go back over this, You'll notice there's always a little bit of residue from the tape, so I like to clean this up with M600 even before I back mask it. And get all the, uh, well, depending on what tape you use, the goop or whatever off. You can also knock that edge down just a little bit with an IBM card or with a uh, IBM card, with a credit card. The heat's getting to me. Anyway, getting these out of the way will be one significant step forward, I hope. While we were up doing a photo shoot with Kenny, I made up three sets of lines, three sets of braided, a foot different, 67, 68, 69. So I'll have some adjustability there. I haven't gotten into the solids yet. I haven't even tried them on a plane yet. And we get a day of non-flying, like, gee, I think every day around here is non-flying. These days that we've had, boy, that field is unbelievable. Oh, well, we hope we can get down Middlesex Saturday with Joe. And then the weekend after that is going to be the Circle Burner Contest, so I'd like to start to get some final trim on this. And there's always something that comes off. I hope this one's got some real goop on there. You can see the goop, I don't know if you can see it up close, this stuff. You don't get that off before you paint. It's a real problem. A lot of times you just let the M600 soak a minute, it'll get that off. Even if you're back masking a plane, you don't want to bury that into the paint. What I'm going to try to do is back mask these in such a way that I get an extra stripe out of them, just to make the tips a little more uh, visible. Even though I don't really like the idea of uh, having a fly this on a two-bladed prop. Well, we haven't tried the five blades yet, and we still have to up pitch that four blade, so, but I really, even, even this, even a little detail like this, I like to make it as nice as possible. Now, no matter what carbon, wood, whatever prop you're painting, this material covers so well, sticks so well, doesn't crack, but make sure you put the, fi the fish eye and flex oil in here. If you use this without flex oil and without fish eye, paint will not have a long lifespan. So, I, and I always, I always mark the jar that I have this mixed in. Always mark it. Yeah, I always have that marked for the prop, so I know what it is. See how I like this little striping after I get a couple of these painted. Won't really matter. I'm hoping Tom Richards is going to be able to get us a decent supply of these props. Boy, these are gold. If you don't have any of these in your arsenal, I don't know what to say. This is the best. And just nice to know that we still have the prop that's on Strega to test. We have the five blade that was on a Spitfire last year to test, the four blade, a lot of stuff left to test. 
But this material really does, let me just, I like to get a coat and get the second coat right on there. It's really hot today. Get the edges done twice. Actually, this is probably the hottest day of the year so far. But again, the trees are moving, and that's it. Oh, I do how nice that paint lays down. It really does lay down nicely. First prop started to have a little blush in it because it really is humid out here. I put a little bit of retarder in the paint. I'm sure this will even go on. See, you can see it's just going on a lot faster and smoother. And as long as you don't get a rub, boy, it really is hot out here. I haven't been outside here for a while. But this material, this black acrylic, if you've never used it, even if you even if you use it on a whole plane, it really makes paint and props real nice. Whether you're trying to get a scale-like prop or just some just to dress up a prowler, it doesn't matter. Always get the edges a little bit extra. Okay, all these little suckers are going to sit out here and dry. And Blue and I just got a call from Karen. She says, finish that bird for you. You've been playing with those brackets. You've been playing with your toy plane off. So I'm going to spend the rest of the day working on my bird feeder. Now see, right under this fish is one of the poly rugs. I'm trying to record every day just a little bit. I got a dozen of them in here. And they're just starting to get their feet. Nice Nagishi toy. Getting caught up in this. These are the plants we got from the circle part of the field. Oh man, getting caught up in this and we've really been having a lot of fun. The water's crystal clear. Fish are jumping and jiggling. Feed me, feed me. That was bullshit, just feed me. Feed me already. It's been a lot of fun having this for a second, third, fourth hobby. Hobby, are you kidding? This is my whole life. I'm gonna be a frog someday. Look at his brother over here. Where's his brother? Frog! Yeah, I got a girlfriend in the pond here. I'm not gonna tell anybody what her address is. But every night they go over in the plants and fool around. The life of a frog. Today, no chance of rain. Beautiful day. Get the plane out. Sun heaven air. Look at the rain coming down. I was in the middle of a flight and it started coming down too, so. Now we're gonna find out if this canopy is waterproof. Look at there's even beads of water inside of it. Ah oh, boy, when you have no luck, I'll tell you. But I did have one little neat thing happen today. I gotta show this. You know, anybody knows what a nut I am. Oh, I gotta bend over. Oh, oh geez, there goes the bone. As I'm coming up here, right out in the middle of the road is a turtle. Oh, he's in the box. There he is. Now, I don't know if he's a snapping turtle or a what the hell is he? He's in my box now. He doesn't look too happy in here. Wait, here I am, it's pouring rain. You believe this? I mean, it is pouring. And this turtle's in here running around inside my van. Unbelievable. We're going to see if he likes the pond. Now, I don't know if he's a water turtle or what. But what happened? He was right out in the middle of the street. And cars were trying to avoid him. And I figured, man, he's a goner. So I figured he'd be safer. Look, here he goes. He's inside. Get away from that Spitfire. Ah! Ah! Look at this. You believe this could only happen to Wendy. Only. Back in the box. Hey! Yeah. If you really loved me, you'd build me a ringmaster so I could learn how to fly. Be the world's first turtle in the Hall of Fame. 
Anyway, anyway, this guy, I don't even know if this is a snapping turtle or what the hell he is, but he's been crawling all around a van for the last hour. You know, he doesn't want to come out to play. Yeah, I'll just bite you if you don't let me go. Anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring him down to the pond. I don't know if he's a water turtle, if he isn't. Obviously, I'll have to bring him back, but if he swims, I'll have to make him a little island. He definitely was a goner. I rescued him from the jort from the tires of death here. Anyway, it's amazing. It's amazing. You go flying and the things that happen to you. Anyway, I'm going to see if I can get a couple of flights here. It stopped raining. Now, it looks like it's going to be a nice day at Middlesex. Boy, did we get caught in the rain yesterday. Oh, what a mess. Took me an hour to dry the plane off. Anyway, at least we realize the pilot won't melt. Joe's already here. The turtle's already in the pond. I got up this morning. I couldn't find a turtle. Maybe he got out and escaped. I don't know. We don't know. It's the mystery of the pond. Anyway, Joe has made up a whole handful of props when we walked our equipment over here. He made up, and I'm going to get him to try to explain these, and we're going to try to do some testing on these today. While the air is really uh, unstable like it is now, it doesn't look like a day to practice patterns. I can see the wing rocking from here. But anyway, it will be a good day to test some props and maybe come up with uh, some more information you can use or... Something you can do to save you from doing something redundantly that we've already done and spent the money and spent the time. Anyway, Joe's already getting a tune-up flight here and we'll see what he's got as soon as he comes down. It's the weekend before the circle burner contest and we've basically just been trying to finalize some of the little stuff that we've been testing. We've got most of it in bags. Got the tiger in the plane. Same prop that we had on in Massachusetts for these conditions. And we'll see if we're going to catch any good air today.
I see this idea in Joe's toolbox. Putting the props in a sock. That's a good idea. I've been putting them in plastic bags. Kind of look like sandwiches in the van. Anyway, as I guess you can see from the flight, it is shifty, shifty, puffy, humpy, dumpy here, but it's good enough for what we're doing. And it's it's definitely better now that we have an official Boeing employee. Where do you see the hat he got me? I'm an official Boeing visitor. Or what, what the hell am I anyway? If I go there and I say, I know Joe Adamusco, they'll charge me for the coffee. Is that the deal? You're an official taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> and official taxpayers are paying for that V-20. You better believe it. But it's an incredible airplane. Like 90% composite. Yeah, I like it. And no matter what the weather is, I always come to the field with one thought in mind or on the way driving down to the field is... You know, what can I what can I kind of learn today or put in a data bank? What can I figure out for future reference? And I'm sure Joe was doing that now on his long commute to Boeing. But anyway, what I try to figure out, now in the case of Joe, he's got four or five props to try today. You don't need to fly out of contest to try props. And actually, one of the things is good is really don't waste a good flying day. A day you can be practicing bottoms. Today is not a good day to be practicing bottoms, and you can see how the air changes from maneuver to maneuver. It's in one side of the circle. It's, it's kind of, actually, it's kind of risky to be getting too cute. You can see the wing rocking. But it's a great day. One thing we can get out of today is some of the prop testing stuff. And Joe's got some 15s and 14s cut down. He's getting comfortable and familiar with pitching his own props. And as long as you're doing wood props, you really, the only way you can get yourself in trouble is if you get them too thin. Don't, don't make them ultra, ultra paper thin. And you can learn real quickly. You can see what effect pitch will have on a, any setup at all. When the pitch is too low and the output is too low, it's going to have a soft overhead eight, soft top on the hourglass. When the pitch or the motor output is too high, what you're going to have is the plane going too fast or and or winding up in consecutive maneuvers. And this is actually an excellent plane to be trying things on because it's kind of a draggy plane, thick airfoil. A little bit bigger and heavier than the Spitfire size planes. So you really get to see the difference. It's a dramatic difference. When, let's say, for instance, you add a quarter of an inch of prop. You go from 12 to 12 and a quarter. It's dramatic. We're on a light plane. It gets better. And yeah, because the 12 was working pretty good anyway, you don't see a dramatic increase or a dramatic drop off. It's a good learning experience. And it's always good. In this case, Joe's got plenty of flights to go back and look at. For instance, when we were here with that big, he's got the big three-blade volley. Plane has incredible line tension and turns 4-7. Goes really fast. Almost unflyable when it gets really windy, it goes so fast. This setup, this is the 14-5 that's on there now, cut to 13. What happens is the plane is a little softer, a little bit slower. Motor is right in its power band where it should be, coming on and off. But one of the advantages, especially for Joe, is that Joe, more than anything, is it gives you a little time to react. And nothing really is worse than under contest conditions when a plane starts going a little bit faster than you'd like it to go. That is the one situation that really makes you crazy. It really does. It really does. You say, oh my God, the plane automatically, when you're at a contest, the plane feels like it's going two tenths faster, even if it isn't. And when it is, Anyway, my feeling on props too is when a prop feels like it's just, just, you say, oh, I wish I could have went in one click on a needle, that's about when it's just right. And that's when it seems like you usually get your best score, your most consistent bottoms. Actually, it's when you have the most fun flying. When you overpower in the plane, and anybody that's had uh, lean runs with tune pipes or lean runs with 60s, it doesn't matter. When a plane is going too fast, it doesn't matter what motor's in the nose. 
And it doesn't matter if it's a well-tuned setup, whether it's a pipe setup or a six, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a double star. It doesn't matter if it's like, if it's tuned, it's tuned. If it isn't, it isn't. I don't know how much simpler than that it really gets, but the props, and I've said it over and over and over, and I really mean it, nothing, nothing comes close to, when you don't have the prop right, nothing can make you more crazy. You try to get line tension with tip weight and nose weight and everything, and it's, it's almost always something you could compensate for right in the prop. Anyway, I'm glad to see that Joe's learning this little by little. Little by little, he's learning fast. got a new guy in the club that said he would meet us down here today. He's really just learning how to fly. He's got a profile. And he's past the time he said he'd be here, so we're just going to keep flying. Wes, you're in big trouble. Kept the 12 and a half. He's a top flight. Say a top flight 14.6. Cut down to what, 13? 12 and a half. 12 and a half, okay. And pitch to 5. Oh, and you did on a pitch gauge? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's got thick blades. Boy, does it ever. <laughs> See what happens, yeah. You're really, you're really thick at the tip. Wow. All right. Well, let's see. Yeah, that's what we're here Talk for. is cheap. <laughs> we got plenty of that. Okay, Mr. 14-5. Those kids out of here? Yeah, okay. really. Yeah, those kids are making me nervous. <laughs> Anytime you have a really strange prop, new prop, something you haven't had on a plane before, in this case, let's see what he's got. He can't find a win. It's always good to take a really safe flight to start with, especially in this air today. Anyway, what will happen is a lot of times if you go down in diameter or down in pitch, down in size, the plane will either have spots where it's not as solid as it used to be or spots where it accelerates. That looks like you got the needle close. And maybe on a rich side. Anyway, this prop had a real, a tremendous pull on the ground. But again, you never really know until you put the combination together. It's like shoes. You see all the shoes in a rack. Yeah, and some fit this guy, some fit that guy. But if you're if you're looking for the personalizer setup for your skill level, prop is a really good way to do it. Now, a lot of times what you do is you get a prop that has a little more pitch in it than what you're really happy with. Let's say it's a 13-6 rev up, which usually has a little more pitch than necessary. And you really can't go home and change the pitch, you can add a head gasket usually, and that'll soften up the power. There's a lot of ways to do it, but if you have a handful of those props all cut and shaped and with the pitch cut in and pitch cut out, you get that it feels a lot easier to change the prop than the head gasket. Unless you have one of those crazy windy spinners with 27 screws. Anyway, another thing the prop sometimes does, if you go from carbon to wood, the plane will be more or less nose heavy or tail heavy. It'll have a little different turn characteristics. If you put a bigger prop on, you're probably going to want to take one turn on the ray rudder and add one turn, maybe two. Sometimes, not always, when you use a bigger prop, you can get away with a little bit less tip weight. 
A lot of, a lot of variation in the prop. The prop is a, an unbelievably sensitive thing for the plane. And I mean, I'm sure all the top flyers that reach the uh, pinnacle of stunt history here, they all have a handful of props. Not many of them just buy one prop. They'll put this prop on a plane and fly it. And the only thing, the, the thing you hopefully can get from some of the tapes, or by actually being at the Nats or talking to other people, talking to a variety of people, is eliminate some of the ones that you know don't work. And then get a, ver get a variety of the ones that you think are going to work on your setup. And try it yourself. Don't make up your mind ahead of time or don't make up your mind even based on what I've said. Try them all. They're inexpensive. A lot cheaper than buying motors, that's for sure. And usually you can really get a tremendous variation in the performance. And on this plane here, we could make this plane easily fly 4-0 if I put a, a 7 or an 8 pitch prop in a lean run. And I could slow it down to where it wouldn't do a wing over if I have a uh, maybe a 3 and a quarter pitch. I got all kind of a ability to change the speed right in the propeller. Just remember another thing with the prop that's good to think. The, when the prop stops working, the plane stops flying. There's, there's a good analogy there. A lot of times when you find a prop that works real good on a hot, hot, now it's really getting hot today. When it gets real hot, you put that same prop on early in the morning when it's cool and the plane's a rocket ship. So you want to be aware of that, that end of it too. But if you know all this ahead of time, or if you have a, a little bit of an idea, which direction to go. In other words, you don't want to get to the field that's a cool morning and go up in pitch. You want to go down in pitch. The same way with your needle. You want to know when a plane's flying too fast. You don't have to be a whiz kid to figure out. Don't go in on a needle. Just knowing what direction not to go in is a big help. And just leaving it alone guarantees you won't learn much at all. You'll just learn how to uh, repeat a mistake over and over again. And that's the challenge of stunt. That's what makes it a lifelong challenge. There's, there's never going to be, absolutely never going to be a computer program. Dial this in and out the other end comes, uh, you know, the world champion Chinaman or something. It's not going to happen. You know, there's just not many substitutes for flying and flying and flying and flying and flying. And you think you've got enough flying? Go fly some more. And, you know, cut them and... Oh, and see if they'll... Yeah, cut yeah, them. Yeah, because I know they're long. Here's what happened. This is a good tip, too. We were landing here, and you see the, see the lines are hooked in the grass? Now, Joe had his lines up here, and they were laying up on top of the, what, what looks like grass anyway. And what happened is I come along landing, and the tail wheel or the carrier hook, as the case may be, did this to his line. So, now, the, the, the key is, and I <laughs> throw the lines away. Don't try straightening them out. I can't even remember who out at Flushing had a set of lines. I was going to fly his plane one day, and I walked the... You couldn't even walk them out. Right. He's, oh, no, they're fine. They're no problem. I won't mention any names. Look. Yeah, it's a good idea. Any, anything even close. Just replace them. I still have the solids if you want to pop one flight on. You never flew this on solids yet, did you? Uh, what length are they? Uh, 69. Whether I, I mean, you just you, on these ones, see what, how it is. you lost the handle setting either way. So what's the what's the sense, you know? Uh, now just let me see how much longer these are. Well, I can cut them down in two minutes. That's no problem. Yeah, we're having a pretty good session. Joe's been working back and forth with his props. Jimmy D is here with his old time ship, and he's got the uh, soon to be world's record holder carrier 60 carrier ship. I don't know if he plans to fly it. The guy is here with the Spirit of St. Louis again. Maybe we'll get to see that fly again. Anyway, that's a nice little plane. He's also got a little Ryan, kind of a little Ryan plane over there. And of course, we're still waiting for Les. He came here for flying lessons. <laughs> we give him flying lessons. First thing we'll do is send him McDonald's for some soda. Hey, Jimmy won Mass. Oh, that's cute. Jimmy won Massachusetts with this. Giving us the optional very low bottom.
Anyway, Joe's been back and forth with all of the props he made, and he kind of settled in on the, let's see, you can tell I know the old time pattern. Kind of settled in on the prop that uh, the 14.5 rev up cut the 12 and a half. And I've settled in today on having the uh, the 12 inch one, the one we used at Massachusetts there. So again, but they're both 14.5 rev ups, and by the way, if you haven't seen that that new prop video, that's got a lot of information about that particular prop. Because there's several other people here now, we're not gonna, we're gonna kinda get away from the testing thing and just try to get a couple of flights. Maybe head out to McDonald's for some lunch. This looks like the wing is still up high, I'll have to mention that to him. Now Jimmy noticed one thing, and this is a good tip. He put the planes in the shade over there. When the sun was beating down on it for about, oh man, it's really hot today, it's over 90. For about two hours, the wing, the outboard wing was up just a little bit. So, we, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Uh, maybe I hope that isn't the heat distorting the wing. So we kind of put, well, we always put them in the shade, and at this time of year, it really gets brutal out here. Plus, to add insult to injury, you over black top and whatever. Anyway, we got about four weeks to go for them before the mats, and we still have lots of things to experiment and play with, fool with. We still need a 64th of a tank shim for that tank. We still have another tank yet to run and try. And we still got to see if when we go home the turtle ate all the fish. Or if we can even find them. I have a feeling he got out of the pond last night and it's history. I gotta count my fish when I get home. Hey, and tomorrow's Father's Day. Gonna have a family day and they're gonna treat me to going over to this this guy Lou's house that has all the koi fish. And let me pick out a Father's Day fish. Can you believe that? Anyway. It's been a good day so far. The big mean 60 carrier ship here. I don't think Jimmy's flown it yet. Well, we may get one of these on video too. 150 mile an hour carrier ship. Got two carrier ships here today. Two one two ships. Oh, this is really a good day. We call this putting them in the hangar, getting them out of the sun. In fact, mine, the way the sun moved, is now back in the sun. I've just been a little concerned with that. I don't want to get any extra touch-up work before the Nats, and there, there'll be plenty just from normal handling the model. That's nice. What is that, your own design? Uh, that's, that's a baby bullet. Oh, I can see. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's cool. Trick 15? What? Is that a 15? Yeah, that's a tiny lanky. Oh, well, that's a real antique engine, huh? Yeah, I just stuck it in there. I wanted to see what happened to the camera. Did you fly it yet? No, I never flew it with the camera. I flew it with the other 15. Uh, well, Jimmy's going to be down soon. If you want to take a flight, let me know. I'll give you a hand. we got to get something to drink. We're dying of thunder. The endurance guy? How long does it go? I don't know. I never flew it yet. I brought it over here to play with it today. Mm, cool. But what is that? A Y? A 21? Yeah. An HP 21? Mm-hmm. It's got a rotary, uh, a rotary disc valve in there to make it four-stroke instead of a... Yeah, yeah, valve. yeah. It's, uh, is it, it's got to be quiet with that little muffler, yeah, huh? Yeah, it's very quiet. But I can't get the goddamn... It's brand new, and I, I run it on the bench a few times. Yeah, yeah. It's brand new, and I can't get it started without a starter. One of the... Uh, Mary Knight, one of the, one of the ladies in the club, has a, a four-stroke, I think, a twister or a banshee or whatever. Yeah. That runs real nice, yeah. yeah. I'm hoping like, to get good gas mods. 
So the propylene oxide adds to the uh, the overall mileage, huh? Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. Good to know that stuff, though. Yeah. Okay, what are you back to? The old, old reliable here? Well, I want to try... Oh, there's another one you got. Oh, the AHM. Oh, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. 13.5 or... Uh, 12 and a half, so. These are great in dead air. They're great in a lot of conditions, but the one place they don't work well is on the runway. They have that acceleration factor. That's every condition in the world, except don't go out on a runway with it. <laughs> don't go to We're the... They don't have runways around here. They don't have any runways. And this is what, a 15-6? Top flight 15-6, cut down to 12 and a half, repitched to 5. A Super M or a regular? Uh, the ones with those power tip points. Oh, it's power point? Uh -huh. But it took a lot of rework, to, and I still didn't do enough. I didn't check the spinner. What are you going to do? You're just going to fill a tank now? Two ounces, it'll run for about three days. <laughs> we charge by the minute, you know. You want us to time it? I'll this, put a clock on it. Get a total, this is like an endurance plane. We're having some kind of event here for endurance. You know, Brian's having it at one contest for a fun, fun thing. Yeah. Now what's the rules? Just whatever you want to run, but it's got to stay in the air or what? Any kind of motor, 075 to 44 ounces of gas. So you got a carrier hook on there, Joe? Nope, got a tail skid, okay. Well, it's plenty quiet, Jim. That's got the rotary valve, right? That's not a... Was that an HP or...? Yeah, an HP-21. Yeah, they got the rotaries. I'm going to see that then. I'm thinking of getting two of those motors to fix the Tiger Cat. It sounds nice. I don't know how much power it's got. That Musco looks like he's straining to hold it. Whoop. 1.4 seconds. I don't think that's going to be the world's record. <laughs> Boy, we bastards. Bless, he says he's going to be here at 8 o'clock sharp. What time is it, Jimmy? <laughs> got to break this guy in right. 12. <laughs> 12. 11.48. Hey, Wes, you're a little late. You're a little late, baby. We're ready to go home. No, oh, no, no, no. The work doesn't come into it. How you doing? Good. How are you? How's it going? Yeah, the 35 plane now. No more of these silly half a trainer things. Yeah, All right, that looks nice. It looks nice. This is your first 35 size plane? Yeah. Okay, great. Ooh, nice weight. Yeah, he's a good builder. I think it's too heavy. No, it's just nice. I now, anybody doesn't know less. Less mistakes and I know where. Less is learning. What did you got to learn today? Outside loops? <clears throat> you learned loops last week, right? Yep. All right, so we get outside loops today. Should be no problem. Should be, yeah. Show them how to do an outside loop, Jimmy. Easy to say. Balance okay? Balance is around here. No. First. No, you're way up. Maybe. Nose heavy. Just something in the rag maybe? That's what I was looking at. Well take the rag off. The rag isn't helping either. <laughs> I balance it without the muffler, maybe muffler. Oh no, that's a deep muffler here. Yeah, you see you're you're way up like a half inch from the leading edge. Should still fly. Yeah, but you just don't. Nice. I mean, it'll still, it'll still, still loop and all. This is yeah. Right. Uh, we got to listen that this thing doesn't overheat with the stock muffler, though. Normally, you have to drill these out to get it to run right. Mm -hmm. If it keeps going two cycle all the time and screaming, we'll take this off so you don't. Okay, you have to listen because uh, yeah. me. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, maybe. Have to overheat the motor a lot, the stock mufflers. Jimmy, maybe stock just for engine. learning the thing, learning loops and stuff, he should take the muffler right off so there's more, less chance it's going to go in. Yeah, but uh, if we take off. Uh, Tank is not uniform. 
it's a regular tank and it doesn't matter. You do just what you did, but you plug the top line. Leave the bottom line there. That's what they call sending in the flow that goes to that corner. It'll run fine. Yeah. But look. Well, we gave Les a couple little uh, basic flying lessons. He's doing consecutive loops now, but he's not ready to go inverted. So I don't want to obviously not push it. And uh, he's a pretty aggressive guy. He's a guy you're going to be seeing more and more of. This is the first plane he built, and it looks fine. First, the first 35 plane. Now today, George brought over this, and this is very interesting. Jimmy made this a Hemi head. It was a squish band head. It's a double glow plug head. It's a little bit heavier than a normal head, so should we want to add nose weight to any of the planes, now we have a good way of putting the nose weight on the plane below the center of gravity. These heads, you can see how big the fins are. They're about 10 grams heavier than the heads that we have machined all the extra material off. So that's one extra trim thing. We also made up another, and you had George anodize these, Another muffler, this is for the double star when we actually get to put it in the sea fire. And we're sneaking up on that day right now. I still want to finalize a few things with the Tiger and I want to get one more spare Tiger. And then the, the plan is to go from that day forward right to the Nats with the double star, assuming that it's going to be an improvement with the two ounces out of the nose. I had read in Noel Dreamback's column about, uh, well, in his newsletter, Scott's newsletter, about getting little dings out with vinegar, and I figured I'm going to do a little touch-up work, so I put purposely put a ding in this piece of wood just to see if, if that would help. Now, it, I don't know really what happens with the vinegar, whether vinegar is the right thing. It seems like water or Windex would swallow wood too, but I don't know for sure. I'd really have to do a comparison test. But Noah Noel, he researched it out, and he, he doesn't tend to write about a mumbo-jumbo. So we're going to be trying that again. But I want to do a test of put three or four identical dents in the wood. Put the vinegar, Windex, water, maybe some other. Well, because what happens is the wood is swelled. You also can try heat. Anytime you get something like this, you can just get a hot towel, a hot paper towel, put it in really hot water that you almost can't. If you burn yourself, it's just about right. And that will usually swell the wood up, too. Now the reason I was puttering with that, I have some time this afternoon to work on getting some of the little dings out of this. And of course it's had a lot of flights now and it has the usual ring marks up on the nose. There's a couple little things I want to check in there. There's been a couple little spots where the fillets haven't stayed down as well as I'd like. And I tried a little trick experiment here. I ran them through with pinholes like I always do with the CA. And then put some real hot epoxy. I heated the epoxy till it was like water. and rubbed it in there with uh, a q-tip. I don't know if that's going to work. That's why I don't want to go running off at the mouth here and telling everybody to try that until we see if it works. But other than that, all the little fillet repairs that I've done on a tail, they seem to be staying down well. Now I always get to this point, and this is really significant. This, this is something you can really put in the bank. Every year I go usually buff the plane out, what I call a rough buffing, somewhere around a little junk on the wing here somewhere around uh, maybe March, maybe February, I don't know. But then what happens as time goes by, as a plane sits out in the sun, you do lose some of that shine. And you can see here we've even lost some of the, some of the gloss. Of course it comes right back. And all you need to do is spend some time. And I've been puttering around with the Gorums just to see just how much time it would take to bring up one of the open bays, bring up one of the areas that had been, you know, not in perfect condition here. And it looks like this paint is still on the soft side. Now, it could be that I, I'm misunderstanding this, I'm misrepresenting it or something. That's really only one month. But I've noticed in the past, as paint gets older and older and older, in fact, Joe Adamusco just ran into the thing of when the paint went on as Mr. Awesome was three years old, he said he didn't even sand it with 1200. He just went right in and buffed it. Well, I've still found there's a little advantage if it's rough or if you have orange peel to using the 1200, but the Gorums really will bring it right back up. And it, this is the advantage of dope. This is the reason I like to stick with something that's the, the devil that you know, not the devil that you don't know, at least for now. Is you always get to a point with this where now we're coming up a month or so from the Nats. What I'm going to try to do is wait for about mm, two weeks before the Nats, a week before the Nats. Then a date that's unflyable, of which we have plenty. I can sit here and do all the individual bays, get all the little edges, and see these edges have stayed down pretty well. I'm really happy the way they've stayed down. 
the tail fillets have stayed down pretty well. There's been a lot of little spots, little touch-ups on the numbers and things that I wasn't crazy about. Again, average people, this is not going to make you know make or break their day, but I'm really trying to make this one of my best efforts, and I'm really trying to put in all the extra time to do all the little things that'll make this just a little bit, one little step ahead of, or better than the Spitfire, or be, actually, am I talking about better than uh, you know all the previous planes I've built? Notice what I try to do. I try to pick a spot on a plane where I know outboard wing should have plenty of paint. Always take plenty of gorms, and I'm going to see if I can do this without actually sanding it down, just by buffing it. But again, you really, you really stack the deck in your favor. If you can get it, if, if it's possible, to get this, I would say, between two weeks and one week before the mats. One of the reasons I'm trying to get a little bit ahead on this is there's other things I want to develop. I still have to do my five-bladed prop thing. I still have props I haven't painted. I still have a motor I haven't, I, I really haven't even set it up. But anyway, even if we go with less than the, the spares that we really need, we'll have the time between the Nats and the team trails to work on them. But I just want to give a little idea of, of just about how much time I really would spend on each panel or each area. And I like to do it in one little area at a time. And of course, you can go buy a thousand dollars worth of material, custom car stuff and everything. You're going to wind up with liking Gorms the best. I'd almost guarantee that. Anyway, once I can see I'm getting scuffed down, and usually it's the stuff, it's amazing that it does come up this quickly. Yes. And all you need to do to see if it's worth doing that is compare it to the bay next to it. In this case, that's real easy to do. Let me just get the rest of this junk off. If you look at it real close, the bay that I did, the bay I didn't do. It's, it's really, it's really a lot a lot nicer and no matter what angle you look at it really does have the gloss so I'll put it around the rest of the day just try to get some of this done it'll give me a little time if that time frame between the week or two before the nets I don't have a lot of time to do this I'll be a little bit ahead but but if I had the all the choices which I always like to have I'd like to do this a, between a two weeks and a week before the nets and you'll get the best bang for your buck or buck for your doe or doe for your deer I don't know I just to look around, as I'm doing this, it gives you another opportunity because you can basically really look around and see any spots you need that need to be touched up. There's always, there's always, there's never a time when you're done touching this up. You can always go back. Now, I've noticed a little spot at the bottom of the roundel. Of course, the two little dots in the fillet where the paint is buffed through. There's a couple little spots here. There's also what I'll call, and I'm going to try to find one here if I can. Here's one. Run, just look down this real, let's see if we can go through this real slowly. I can't really see it. Right here is where it is. You see, it's a wood seam. Now, if you want to get rid of a wood seam, what you have to do is get a sanding block and some 1200, because the clear actually has a ditch in it, and you can, bl you can black out the clear. Once it dries up, and then you can rebuff that right, solid right through, and that'll be per hopefully be perfect. Anyway, these are just some tips you can use to get your plane in the front row. Look at what's out here. Let's see if we can find him. Where is he? Okay, there's a fox out on our field now. That's the only fox. Go ahead out there, Bobby. Go ahead. Don't worry. They don't bite. What is it, a 35? Better watch that rabies. That's a red fox. That's only a pup. Tell them they don't come out like that unless they have rabies. That's only a pup. Robert, he's going he's gonna to kill you. You don't like that red Look at this, he's kicking all his fleas on my circle. <laughs> Look at this. Yes, yes, Jeez, we got deer, we got foxes, we got turtles. What the hell else is going to come out here now? <laughs> it's only a pup, pup Wendy. That's a baby, yeah. Yeah, pup. Go ahead, get on your bike and go chase him. Wait, Robert, go get him. <laughs> Look at, he's afraid of Robert, too. No, when you fly, he comes out and watches you. He won't go even go in the woods when you're flying. No kidding. He watched me and Jimmy the other day for an hour. Oh, the he didn't. Same one? The same one, yeah. And then there was some deer in the woods here that, in the middle of a flight, they galloped through the circle. Yeah. 
Sabatino the Fox Killer. Oh no! Let's see the new product. Product review. What's this? This is just a uh, tank mount. Is that tank? Okay, profile tank mount? Yep. And how does it work? For no look now, huh? Okay. You need to strap the tank on her. He had a glue. Okay. Glue. And these little guys for the motor van pit. Now he had to make some of these with the offset too. Yeah, I don't know. Right, so, so you can you, move the tank up and down. You yeah. see, here's the thing. When a guy is trying to make a product and he really, he's close but no cigar. He's not got this the area bigger than the motor mount facing. This, this, this area here should be half inch further forward. So you have a bigger footprint right. and it would be better. Right. This, this is no better than just mounting the motor on, because this is as hard as the motor. Right. So, but you ought to ask the teller guy or whatever, whoever's making them, just make this front bigger and make it wider. Right. You give you more to make a footprint. Support. A footprint is what you right. want on this. Yeah, except most of these things are using three eighths mounts. So it's three eighths. Okay, so you make three eighths and half. What good is three eighths if you have half? You, you might as well take it off your airplane. Well, this is an out. Right People should use out. them as a drill mm -hmm. template. Is all. What is the TS for? No, oh, tech special. special. Okay, but that's fine. What? Right. The mount has the. Uh, the Let me see that. Let me see the windy one. This is what I'm talking about. This gives you a bigger footprint. That's the whole idea of doing it. The idea of you only make it exactly the size of the amount, it does feet, there's no purpose to it. So he'll he'll figure this out eventually, but No, it, it doesn't matter who makes it. If you make aluminum, see when I made aluminum pads and you make them the same size as the motor, they have no there's no value to it. Do they have a offset? He could figure this out though, I'm sure he will. If he's yeah. doing CNC, you just program right. that in. Yeah. Right. What the hell is the sense of uh, My doesn't have any offset? All he's got to do is CNC this material up a little more. Right, it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. You, you, you don't need Where'd the fox go? You guys no, the run the fox off? Grind itself into off the wood. The road. Well, then you just use two straight uh, pieces of lumber. I gotta go These do brickwork. Can't have any more fun today. For my Father's Day present, the kids got me five more Japanese koi. So there's eleven in here now. And last night, honest to God, this is true, the turtle came out at night and he was swimming around and going crazy here. I couldn't believe it. And we have outdoor lighting too now, so it's really been fun. These are the plants I got this morning from up by the club field. A lot of this stuff came from the club field. Now we're just basically having some fun here. We're going to try to work on a profile for Kenny today, if he ever gets over here. Hey, look at this yeah, guy. Profile Wendy's, King. Wendy's is better. Profile King. Alright, what is this, a Banshee anyway? Uh, if you remember, Richie Tower was uh, playing around with something called Good Vibrations. Right. And he built that 20... Oh, right, this is that Polywog wing. Polywog. Right. If we don't have enough Polywogs around here. And Bobby Hunt had, had built this stuff okay. for him and I got it from I got it from Richie years ago so since I need a profile what I did was yeah, I have good the, choice I have the drawing what I did I just made a profile fuselage the same size as the drawing motor mounts go back to about here what seems mm -hmm. to work what f figures as as just a, an eyeball thing for me I run the motor mounts about back about as far as the tank would go and that seems to be about the right amount of motor mount well this looks like it's going to be it's going to be way nose heavy. This what's the dimension from here to here? I've got it written down. It's uh it's about 10 10 inches. Let's see what dimension you have here. That looks it's 10. Okay. 9 and 9 and, nine and change. And then your um, tail moment is what? 16 and a half. That'll be close enough. Um yeah, they're actually the dimensions are closer to being a 60s ship, and it is. Yeah, it's going to be a large aeroplane. Okay, this is an unequal panel profile, so what we're trying to do is get the bell crank. Let me show. Up. So the push rod comes out and doesn't rub on the side of the body. That's, get, that's cutting it close, but that's the only way I think of that, that you're going to get this and I still have a forward up line. This is my plane sticking out here. Remember the big yellow one I had with the big wing? What are you working on, Jim? Making lines? I was just uh, adjusting the carrier lines a little bit. Okay. Right. I had to run it with an extra. Let's well, see if we can get the bell crank in here for Kenny. Another Kenny? Another Kenny. There's too many Kennys. I just want to ask you if that's Most ready Kenny's for some speed. I mean, I, I know I got a dope. Oh, Corsair. No, it's terrible. 
This is, is this is absolutely unusable. You got razor edges here on everything. Jeez, I'm not over sand them. Oh my God! If you put silk spray on this, it might tear just from the shrink. How there's no edge, really there's no radius on that at all. the shit out of them. Hold the wing. I'll do one for you. Just hold the wing. That's the single most important thing. Is hold that wing. That's got to be round, de dead round. I mean, not even just a little bit round. Okay. I could, got some of those, you know. You could take one of these if you want. Yeah, you right. your hand, yeah. No, I just want to. I want to get that he knows. Hey, maybe I get him to do it for me. Better yet. You go. Well, you go to Andrea's. Got and a lot get, of time, Wendy. You go to Andrea's and get the food because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> yeah, that that edge now is how it should be. <laughs> if, especially here, if that's sharp. There's nothing you can do to repair that once you tissue the plane. Do you well, stuff. I didn't want to do it. Yeah, that's super important. Super important. Well, Still got a little bit of a bow in it. Late. You've been putting ammonia on it? I did. Take ammonia. Just soak the whole thing with yeah. ammonia. You're I did right. it with Clorox. Yeah. Well, no, well ammonia is good. It's a considerable good. amount of weight. Yeah, well, uh, I did it two or three times. I got most of it out, but it still got some. You still got some, though. Yeah. You know what? Ammonia is so much Should better. Should I try to get it out? Right? Ammonia is the best. Right. Ammonia. Then do it outside, so you'll choke okay. to death. Right. Uh, what happened with Yeah, ammonia uh, It really was awkward getting this bell crank. Well, let's see if we can line this up. I know there's a lot of different ways to do this, but we want to get the, it's a profile body and not have the push rod run into the body and not have to put the bell crank bolt sitting out in midair, so I think this will be okay. All right, we're ready to join this up and get the alignment. You get the epoxy? I got epoxy. Okay. This baby sitting this, let's show what you're doing. It's just we've got it glued together and we're just waiting to see looking down at sight. In fact, I'll sit on the other side of the room. You just hold it straight. Point the trailing edge right at me. That'll be... That's going to be real good. Just babysit it. While well, the epoxy kicks off and then we'll set up to do the fiberglass work. Okay, now always, when we're cutting glass, cutting it over newspaper with a scalpel blade, lay it out, want to make ellipses. We just put some little dots on there. If you can, and get, get the glass so it's going this way, the grain, because if you have the glass going straight, this much of the half of the glass isn't doing anything. So if you can, it's free lunch if you can get it to go in an X dimension. Cross, cross grain it? Well, in an X dimension. And you make each, each ellipse, can just a little bit smaller, you know, half inch smaller or so. This way, when you sand it in, you can bury it in less paint. You just can bury it in that much less paint. Now, if you want to, you can use that one for a pattern. Take and lay that back up on here, and take the pen and put dots all around it if you want to be cute, and this way they'll all match. They'll all be the same. You just do it with a marker pen. Well, I, we just had one here. You get all the ellipses out, then we'll pull that wing apart. On the wood yet? Doesn't matter if you didn't. No, just I interpolate didn't. it. Okay. All right. Always use the yes, tubes yes. where one one tube is twice as big as the other. Ken's already got the glass already cut. We already did the other side for practice. How much of that are you doing? Same amount you did. Six stripes. Uh -huh. Six. Oh, wait, I supposed to be three. Ah! Ah! I ruined my plane. <laughs> Put twelve, and you'll just take them off. I'm glad I'm not paying for the epoxy here. Thirty-eight. This is your epoxy. Thirty-eight degree triangles. What are you talking? Flies a little big. Ken's a little confused. He's had a hot day in the sun. I'm becoming Polish. Oh my God! This is really in labor intensive. 
takes a lot of practice. Oh, it's not cold. Mix it. Don't play with it. Mix it. Mix it. Come on. You're playing. Don't play. Mix. Well, who, who is your mix. Oh. Boy, I'm glad we're not mixing a tub of cement here. Yeah. Holy oh, mackerel. Man. I'd never have my bricks done. We showed you how it's done, huh? Okay. Yeah, was this coming? This looks sloppier than the side I did. It's much sloppier than the side. Start in the middle and work, make a sunburst. You, what you want to do, you're pressing hard and the material is thick. You want the material to be like water. Or, okay, you see, see what it is? It's not hot, it's not, the material isn't thin enough. You need it to be like water. More heat. Well, more heat is not always the answer, but... You got a lot of it out of there. Yeah, and you don't want to get it all off, or it's, you defeat the whole purpose. See, when it thins out, you should not have to press down at all. Just drag it across, and it should come off. Start in the middle, always make a sunburst. Let it just drag off onto the edge. There you go. Oh, God, yeah. oh yeah. So that's the whole thing is to get it wet enough that you can just, just drag the trowel. Uh, don't don't go crazy. They'll sand right off. Okay. See, like you get a hair here, you can pull this off. But don't make yourself crazy. Put a hair on a blob, it'll go away. A blob, right? And the other thing, let it sit for a couple of days. Put it out in the sun if you can. Let it let it cook. If you try to sand that the next day, it's a nightmare sanding it. Now the kids were very good. They bought me two fish for Father's Day, and Karen bought me five. So at some at some point in time, here it's getting a little crowded. Anyway, some of the plants that we got from the Circle Burner Field. These are the plants, but I've been bringing a few home every day. Some of them look real good. Some of them look kind of mediocre, but. Hey, I'll tell you the price. You couldn't beat the price. It was great. Anyway, I really have enjoying the fish. But I got props to make today. It's an unflyable day. The wind is blowing all over the place crazy. So, good day to make up some props. Now, we kind of thought we were going to work on the, uh, the repair of the PM today, being it's kind of a crappy day. But Jimmy was busy. Couldn't make it down here. And we have so many other things that I'm going to just try to get the props out of the way before anybody else gets here and maybe get some of this stuff done today. This, this should be about a one or two day more to finish this up. All the props we were working on, I got the tape pulled off of these. I kind of like that striping effect anyway. And we got a nice, uh, well, nice variety of diameters here anyway. Whoops. I have to tell you though, it's, it's really getting intense because we're getting down to the nitty gritty on the gnats here. And this is the time of the time of year typically everything starts getting backed up. I'm trying to get them in order here so I can mark them. Anyway, there's a couple of motives for getting this stuff finished. I'd like to get at least one flight on every one of the props. Oh, look at this. President Nixon. Now, before President Nixon so rudely interrupted me here, doesn't, he doesn't realize I have to get ready for the Nats. Anyway, Joe brought up a good point when we were testing big props for Joe, that was last Saturday or whenever. He had some props that were cut down from 15 sixes and de-pitched. And he made a good point that when you're using a, a bigger prop like a 15, there's a lot more wood, you can change the pitch angles. And, well, he checked, if I go back and look at the tape, I think he tried three or four different props, and he wound up liking the one that I like the best. And I still like... I. It seems like it wouldn't be this way, but it is. It seems like you go back and forth a million times, and you always wind up with some variation of a 14.5 rev up. And as I would just guess the cardinal rules are for a plane which the, the Sea Flyer is a little under 60 ounces now with all the light hardware in it, 12 inches of diameter seems about right, but I know from the past, from the Red Baron and from some of the other Cardinals. I know some of the some of the 70 ounce planes liked them up in the 12 and 3 quarter 13 inch range. So my suggestion was 
if as get as many as you can. Obviously, it's, it's difficult to get them. Even Tom Richards is having trouble getting delivery on them, and and he knows the guy that makes them. But anyway, if you're lucky enough to have a few of these, having them in variations of diameter above about an eighth of an inch is really a nice idea. Another point Joe brought up, it's a really a safety factor having the tips painted yellow. When you're taking batteries off and doing things, it's nice to see that yellow arc. Kind of gives you a little confidence that you're not going to stick your arm or your hand or your nose or something, whatever. Anyway, one of the things I want to do, I always like to make a little simulation of the decal. Like the Rotor props always have some kind of a little insignia. Now I know somebody out it that's watching the videos who's real hip to the scale things knows where you can buy these little decals. I don't know where to buy them. Ed Gallagher and several other people tried to find a place that you could buy the real Rotol decals. We have we I've written four or five letters to different scale people. I've never found a source for them. But if anybody does have a source, hey, I'll put it on a video. I'll put it in a column. I know a lot of people really enjoy having a scale like prop. So having uh, having said that. Let me sh shuffle the cards here. I want to start laying out, and obviously none of this is critical, and I may even get enough of these done today that I can get some of the clear on. Now another thing too is, I like to get the lettering on, and then get a dry coat of clear over the lettering. Dry coat of clear over the edges, all the edges I'll card off. In fact, one of the things that I left out the last time I updated that video was carding off Just knock the little edges off before you actually do the painting. And one of the people that's been doing, I'll, I'll, just a prediction of mine, one of the people that's been real good about picking up all these little paint tips is Ken Thompson, and I expect he's been working on that profile a couple of days this week. I expect he's going to really get into the finishing end of it and maybe do some real nice finishing work real early in his in his world of stunt which a lot of people don't really get to do but the problem with that can be that if you're building and finishing skills get ahead of your flying skills you wind up crashing planes that took hundreds of hours to build so maybe that isn't really the greatest asset in the world I don't know Robert Sabatino has been flying that Nobler flying the wings off it and by the way that is an excellent excellent plane for a first built up plane deal especially if you don't have to carve the turtle deck like we've done and take a lot of the shortcuts like making a flat tail. Now I'm sure that's not approved by uh, some people that design planes, but the reality is it doesn't make a bit of difference. The plane still flies great. I've made similar cardinals with flat tails, built up tails, airfoil tails. I haven't seen any real significant difference or any significant benefit one way or another. I'm going to take a little break from doing this lecture set on the props. Got this picture today, and it's a real, you can see how old the photograph is, from Charles Mackey. Charles Mackey, of course, the legend of the Spitfire, the uh, Gobble Schwantz, uh, probably 50 other planes. A very prolific builder in the 50s. And I sent him a set of sweeper plans, and, and I'm just going to read this real quick. Your sweeper must have shaken up the troops. I kind of get the feeling you like to do that, right. You know I like that airfoil, and of course he's talking about the sweeper airfoil, which which was hundreds of hours in development, and I can't understand why it wasn't a good wind flyer. Well, it wasn't that bad either. You just needed to be strong. It looks like it had everything it needed to be a great wind flyer. Big planes are definitely superior, and that's, that's emphasized. I could never get used to that line pull. I would like, now this is the, the part that relates to the story. I would like to share with you an unusual story about big airplanes. I had a friend named Dalton Bell who was learning to fly stunt. Dalton decided he would build the world's largest stunt ship. He couldn't afford all the balsa wood, so he sawed all the little pieces and sanded out hardwood for all the construction. It took him all winter to build the airplane. He called me and wanted to go test flying in the spring. We were about ready to fly when another guy walked up that, <laughs> up that we had never seen before and said he lived in the area. He said he had a big airplane too. And when he came back with it, it was bigger than Dalton's. Well, nobody was ever bigger than a sweeper, so we don't have to worry about that. We <laughs> Now back to the letter. We just had to sit there and laugh. I think I could scrape up some photographs of the two planes if you have any interest. Neither airplane flew very well. Well, unlike that, let me, let me assure you, the sweeper did fly well. 
and Charles, of course, is getting to be a good pen pal and a good friend. Thanks for the photo. Believe me, you had to be a real man to fly that plane. And that is a good airfoil. I always try to come up with something that simulates that little that little emblem. I noticed from the pictures it was blue, and what I've been doing is cutting out little squares from these big letter sets, and just pretty much improvising. It's not a scale model, so it doesn't really matter. Improvising something that, that simulates that rotor decal. Anyway, you can see what I did. I just took that little piece of the five. And you can be pretty creative here. Some of them I even put an R, a black letter set R in there, but basically this is just a line up. And I always, I always see I attach it to the table with some tape, otherwise it's really hard. You're on an angle, it's going back and forth. Difficult to do. In fact, I got a scratch on this one. Another thing too is that before I paint these, I'll get an ink pen and just hit this edge so all the edges are nice and straight too. bad problem is I had to put retarder. I painted one prop and it looked like it fogged up, so put a little bit of retarder in. See if this one looks a little better. Remember, never go beyond 10% retarder or you're going to melt the whole plane. It can happen. Even at 10%, you're in a high-risk situation. Glue joints can loosen up. Let's get an idea of how this material dries up. It is really nice to work with. In fact, I see it's starting to rain. <laughs> Jeez, I got luck we're having today. Those days you just can't. You see now, just you can see there's still a little bit of grain. In fact, I'm getting raindrops on here. I'm going to rush through this. I want to get this in. First coat, usually I'll give it one coat or even two coats. Get the edges extra. George is on his way over here. We're going to go do some masonry work in the rain. Oh, man. Anyway, this is really nice material. Now I got this photo in today's mail, too. It's from Pat Travers from Baltimore. He's going to be coming up to the, uh, the Circle Burner Contest next week. I look forward to meeting him. It looks like he did a real neat silk span job, and it should be a super light plane here. It's a Cavalier, Randy Smith OS40. And Pat, we look forward to sharing a circle burner contest with you. I hope we're going to get to see this guy fly. Looks real nice. I'll send this on the Stunt News. All right, back to doing those props. You can see what, <laughs> what kind of luck we've had. Just got those props painted in time. Anyway, they're sitting outside drying. And that retarder, by the way, the same as, uh, as we did on the last video, working with Jim Damarell's plane, that retarder, allows us to paint on a day when we virtually have 100% humidity. Well, <clears throat> while on the subject of props, I was trying to explain, as a fellow Don that's in the club, I was trying to explain to him about props, some basic, simple information. And basically what I was trying to explain to him, we want more or we want less. And how to try to identify what some of the telltale signs that you don't have the most efficient prop possible on a plane. Now just as an example, as an example, he was running a Tiger 51, I think, with a I think an 11.5, but I'm not sure. It was one of those props you can't read the numbers on. But anyway, it was very weak in the overhead eight. Well, that's a, that's a telltale sign. Weak overhead eight. That's usually weak above 45 degrees. Top of the hourglass. Look for these telltale signs. This is always a situation. Look for the telltale signs. These are the signs that are, that are showing you that you need more diameter or more pitch or both. 
Now, just a good example. This is just a perfect example. When we took his ship and put on a 12.5, it was like magic. 12.5 zinger. All of a sudden, overhead eights, solid as a rock. Top of the hourglass was boom, boom, boom. No problem at all. Got rid of these two problems. More diameter, more pitch, or both. And this is, this is just a direction you should be thinking about going in. Now the other, th the other side of that, if you're flying on a runway, clean air, and you have excessive wind up, the first thing you want to do if the wind is blowing this way is bias the maneuver so that the loops are on this side. It's called bias. Bias will do as much as having the right prop on the plane. You never want to have the, the maneuver exactly downwind. That's part of, part of the whole problem. People, years ago when they got suckered into this thing of believing that tune pipes cure wind up, and, and <laughs> I do not believe that for one minute. I think that's all nonsense. But anyway, beside the point, biasing the maneuvers, Obviously, there's some maneuvers that are impossible to bias, like the eight. Some of the, some of the vertical eights, uh, you know, it, it just you can't bias it more than a certain amount. You can't start flying 30 or 40 degrees off center, but biasing them a little bit into the wind, outsides a little bit, downwind, that seems to be a big help. That helps allows you to fly in more and more wind. Another thing, speaking about props. You usually, when wind up is excessive, the things that usually will kill it is a head gasket, number one. If you're going to use the prop, you already have a head gasket will help kill some of the wind up. But, but less pitch will too. If you want to leave the head gasket this way it is, just get a prop with less pitch or less diameter or both. And see, I know what somebody's going to say. They're going to say, oh no, I had this certain setup and I went and put a bigger prop with more pitch and it was better. That's going to happen some of the time, but not always. A general rule of thumb, runway air, you need less pitch, less diameter, or both. That's always my feeling and you always have to be concerned with. The biggest single thing is biasing the maneuver. Okay, a couple other little tips that'll help. And these, this is basically aimed at runway air. The wind is blowing in this direction. These are things that may, may transition into allowing you to fly in more and more wind. I would like to have an imaginary line go down the circle. Let's pretend that this now is the circle, the flying circle. And that for the sake of argument, you're right here. So let's get a rough idea. If we were going to try to do the wing over, that's one of the things. Let's let's pretend this is still the, the wing. I would like to start the wing over just before this because the wind is going to catch the rudder and almost put it right on track. Same thing with the pull out here. You want to try to be dead downwind. You want to try just before. Because what happens if you get to here, now you've got that. You want to pull up just before and let the wind kind of push it into position. Same thing downwind here. You want to try to just let it get it totally downwind and then snap it if possible. The one thing you want to avoid at all costs, at all costs, is not to overfly the wind. Now, let's just walk through a, a pattern real quick here. And I know this is information that's worth its weight in gold. I see the wind is getting really strong. We're going downwind. I want to bias my inside loops basically in this quadrant. Inverted flight, of course, you've got to deal with backing up a little bit here and adjusting the controls at both sides. But outside loops here, so that almost, they would almost touch. That would be my first choice. The squares, I would say, are going to be a mirror image of the insides. Now, there's one thing you want to remember. If you do happen to get the squares here, as you're in this position, the wind is going to be blowing you down toward the ground. So, if possible, this leg, this is the critical leg and the critical pullout is right here. That should be dead downwind. And these are like oversimplification of flying lessons, but they really work. Coming up into the outside square, I would want to hit this corner. 
dead downwind if possible. Because if you're over here, if you're over here, President Nixon calls you. Let me get the phone. Way right back to the wonderful world of stunt. As I was saying, if you try to bias the outside square this way so that the, the direct down downward leg is right about at exact point the wind would be blowing downwind. That's usually the way I like to do it. Triangle, I always like to favor a little bit on the upwind side. Reason for that is this is the pullout, and the pullout is where you don't want the wind blowing you down. Over here the wind is going to be accelerating. <coughs> Otherwise the wind is going to be working in your favor. It'll tend to speed up here. Stay the same there. In fact, it'll have better tension with the wind blowing than without the wind blowing. And the pullout won't accelerate right here, so that's one of the major things. Again, let me just continue the line here. The 8, obviously, you want to try to bias so the center is right downwind. Square 8, the same way. In the wind, it would be pr obviously to your advantage to not fly out any longer than you have to. Vertical 8, I'd like to get it dead downwind if possible, and that can vary to also favoring just a little bit on the upwind side, or dead downwind. Same thing with the hourglass. Overhead 8, right through, if possible, right through. And the four-leaf clover, I don't know if I'm even on the page here anymore. Same thing on the four-leaf clover down around, with the, the intersection leg directly downwind. So if you look real close, you get a get just a rough idea, and this is not obviously not one of those things where there's no other choices, but this is something that will probably help you make it as convenient or comfortable as possible to do your flying in the wind. Another useless day of weather, so I think I'll finish up these props try to get ready for the weekend. Looking forward to spending another day with Joe. Maybe we'll get some flying video even. Anyway, 1200 sandpaper and guess what? Good old Gorms. Gorms on a sock always seems to work the best. That's where you do actually do both sides of the prop at the same time. Most of these balance relatively easily, so it's not a big deal to get them all balanced. But I want to get them balanced. I want to get them put on a wire in sequence, and then they'll be ready for testing. And we may get to test some of them this weekend, depending on the weather. What we try to do is make a little piece of music wire and store six or eight or ten of them that are similar, similar in pitch with slight variations. Now, in fact, what I did here, I don't have them in sequence, but it's not really a, a big problem. But the idea is to have things organized so when you get to a major contest or you get to somewhere where you want to do some testing. Now, in the case of Saturday with Joe, if assuming we're going to get some flyable weather, I would like to go right through these. One, two, three, four. Because a lot of times you'll see, one of the things you can always see when you go add in diameter or take in diameter away, You'll always see at some point in time there's a big drop off in performance. At least I've found that to be true. Now see, now they're in sequence. Great. A little rubber band on top and bottom. But you always want to find the optimum. In other words, another thing too, on a really hot day to be aware of, when it really gets hot, let's say it's 90 degrees plus, what can happen is all of a sudden you'll see that, that, that drop off in performance. Well, at that point in time, What's nice is just take a prop that's got an eighth inch less diameter, same prop, and you've already flown it, so you know it's, uh, you know, there's no surprises, it's not out of balance or anything. Storing them in a little plastic bag keeps them from getting beat up more than necessary, so this, this is pretty much one little test segment of the program that'll be ready for this weekend, I hope. All right, now just to show you what a good guy this Les is, take a smile. Because years from now, he's going to be an expert. <laughs> yeah. He went home, took a pattern, made up all the plywood Excuse parts. Excuse me. 
I did myself. Oh, I, I didn't take okay. from you. But you got the idea. You figured yeah. out how it works. Okay. I saw it. That's yeah, it. that's very good, boy. You're going to be good. Now he's going to. We're going to go over by the machine where we give him a little uh, good time Understand. to use the sander and sand it smooth. We got to make a cable for it, and you got to make a thing for the blind here. I'll give I you all it. that. I got it. Oh, you got it, man. Let's see. I mean. Come on, you're gonna be professional. Not so big like that's yours, but I think oh. money. Yeah, fifty cents for a handle. See, that's good. See, I think it will be enough. No, no good. That's too. Point. What is going to happen is this is so thin, the cable's going to move. Okay, take a couple. Hey, you're going to make some more handles. Make me make two, four. Take make for yourself two more handles when you get time. Okay. okay, you need screws in the corner. The screws go in the corner, so when you slide that on a concrete, you could take some tubing. You want some tubing? I got it, I got it. You got tubing? Got, you got these to make for the bolt? For the bolt in here? But I saw a uh, blind, two. blind... Uh, you could use a blind up, but this is a, this is okay too, because it doesn't come out the other side. It doesn't matter. Okay, but if, if you have a question, then just ask, that's all. And I if you need the bolts, you got 440 bolts too? Yeah, I got it. Okay. I thought, uh, I thought that this uh, goes through. No, no, it just goes right in. That's when it comes on a concrete, it doesn't scratch. Uh, uh, this is just, just for... To keep it nice, because yeah. you're going to put a nice finish on this. Polyurethane. Polyurethane or epoxy is a good finish. And put your name on it too, because otherwise at the field, if you leave it there, nobody knows who it is. If your name's on it, then if they take it, you can what sew them. this? Dural aluminum? Dural aluminum, yeah. Anodized aluminum. Just go slow. It takes time when it's sanding belt. There you go. Then the inside part here will do the Dremel tool. Believe me, this guy is going to be a pro. He is really into this. It's hard to believe. you got to give him credit. Here every day working on this stuff. This is in there. <laughs> he is really a pro, believe me. This guy got out again. Ha! Ha! He's out again. He was. Ah, come over here. Yeah, you silly thing. Ah! 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 You can't swim. See? You can't believe he's been in a pond for two weeks. All he does is swim around. Hey, put me back in a pond. Now, what I decided to do, because he doesn't really look like he's had... God, he's going to fall off the table again. He falls, he jumps off things. What I really decided to do, he doesn't look like he's having that much fun in the pond. He isn't He isn't a social animal, I guess. And we were trying to look at, at his feet to decide if he was a, a water turtle. He swims like a champ. But, and I'll bite you, Nowski. Ah, ah, ah. I'll bite you. I'll bite you. You think I'm not tough? I'm tougher than Scott Smith. I'll cut a foam wing out of your head. Anyway, I'm going to bring him back to the club field tomorrow and turn him loose a little bit away from the road where I found him. I'm just, uh, <laughs> he wants to bite me again. Ah, 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 we don't like to, you to bite me. You'll be in big trouble. We'll make a foam wing out of your shell. I'll make a wheel pant out of you. So here's the deal. He's going back to the field tomorrow. In the meantime, I don't want him in the pond. I scooted the whole pond out clean. But he's been fun. He's been a good visitor. He's been a lot of fun to have around. Back in the box, Mr. Well, speaking of the pond, Karen has added some more flowers. We've had these, these big things growing here are called taros. We took some taros from the club field. It looks like they're doing just as well as you can expect. We have 15 fish in here now. The kids got me two more fish for Father's Day. Everything's jumping and jiggling. I don't know, it's been a lot of fun. I'm going to go back down to the shop to get Wes to uh, work on that handle. He's a good kid, boy. They're coming, okay? Hey, all right. That's it. And the last little bit inside, I'll set up a sanding drum on a Dremel tool to go outside and do that. There you go, look at this guy. How do you say pro stunt in Poland? How do you say pro stunt in Poland? Proska stuntska, huh? <laughs> He's 
like a big dry and cheaper. Uh, just don't stick your finger in there. You'll find out about that belt sander. Now you're going to be famous and then you're going to say, you have any pictures of me when I was young? Ryan Kiefer of the future. Oh, you got more Spitfire movies to watch. Oh, I had this thing about the V-Stall, too. This, uh, I've been watching it over and over. I'm, here it is, the Pogo and the Spitfire Air Show. Anybody's interested in that Pogo video, man? What a great one that is. That's been on TV. Really stupid commercials. Anyway, I really have enjoyed working with Les. He's got two planes ready to fly. We're going to try to get with him this weekend a little bit. Coming up on the end of this tape, and boy, I'll tell you, between Spitfires and Pogo, that Pogo tape is unbelievable. And needless to say, anybody wants a loaner, you know, give me a, hey, coupon for free pizza or something. Anyway, this is another good video. A lot of good Spitfire stuff, Seafire stuff, Hurricanes. I love having the tapes. The tapes are really awesome. Working okay? This is it. It works the best when you don't hear it slowing down. Then it's it's nice and smooth. Put my brother back to circle bar off the other, I'll bite you in the ankles. You'll be in big trouble. I'll bite the lead outs in tsunami and you'll crash. That'll teach you. Anyway, this has been one of the most enjoyable weeks of the whole season. We have really had a good time with a lot of things, and it really is fun helping new people like us. You look for him more and more in the future. Got another load of these mica schist rocks. These are really dressing up the yard. We got some outdoor lighting now in the garden. The garden's getting a little more bloomy than it always was. Oh my god, the turtles are turtling. The wisteria's climbing up the vine. See if you really if you see what an ongoing thing any of these things are, they're just totally ongoing. Even the fish are an ongoing thing. I get used to wearing the hip boots every day now. Get in the pond. These guys are getting to be my friends. It's been fun. Hey, we'll see you on the next video. We got the sea fire all set up with a five blade that's been pitched and we're ready to give it a shot. Coming soon to a theater near you. The car's loaded up, but we are, de we are definitely at the end of the tape. Boy, there is nothing I like more than seeing this thing with the four and the five bladed props. It just looks so scale. Anyway, prop testing day coming up, fun day coming up. Who knows if Wes will sand his fingernails down to where he'll uh, have to quit his job as a manicurist. Anyway, it's been fun. Thanks for joining us. Share the tape. Pass them around to all your friends. It's no fun if you don't share it. No problem, right? Enough? I think. More, more. That's the, come on, round that off. Come on. Round it off. The straight one I can on. Um... No, no, round it more, round it more. Hey, and here's another thing. My wife is growing real spearmint leaves here somewhere. One of these, is, I don't even know which one it is. One of them is spearmint. And she puts it in all the iced tea now that summer's here. Fantastic, real spearmint. Today's project, we got 15 bags of red cedar mulch to put in the garden. You know, I'm looking forward to that. There's another day shot that I could be flying. You've been watching the tapes, you remember when my wife painted these bird houses? Unbelievable. We have had so much fun.
write at least one thing good. You won't see me on the next video. I'll be up the circle burn a field. And when I get big, I'll run out in a circle and bite his stooge wire. Anyway, hey, thanks for joining us. It's been fun. <laughs> as much fun as having this turtle around, though. In the last scene, our ongoing growing rosebush now reaching up to the third floor. Les, are you finished? Yes. This guy takes all day to make a handle. You gotta be able to do that in half the time. Okay. Now you take sandpaper by hand, fine sandpaper. That's fine. Take a piece of 220, sand it, and I'll put some polyurethane on there for you. I got polyurethane downstairs. Maybe the first... Uh... Yeah, 220. Just take it right off to the bench. 20, sand, nice. And I use that polyurethane wood finish. That works out good. It'll dry in five minutes. You could go home and put the cable in. And you got to drill. See, what you got to do when you're done, mm -hmm. you got to drill this, dremel this out so you could put that piece for the cable yeah. in there. Okay, as long as you know that. Professional, totally professional.